the surface, and then this one is referred to as a guy bicuspid. For a cuspid, think canine, right? That single point up at the top, whereas the bicuspids tend to have two cusps on the teeth. Okay? All right, now in terms of uh, material here, the outside of the tooth is coated with that enamel, that extremely hard surface, made up of a lot of uh, phosphorus and calcium. And then just below that, <coughs> here, is this stuff called dentin. This is calcified material, meaning there's a lot of calcium in it. <coughs> and then we also have this thing called a pulp cavity. Here. Pulp cavity. Pulp cavity. In the pulp cavity, circulatory system, right, uh, you'd have the capillaries, and you'd also have nervous systems, so you'd have uh, neurons that are uh, in the pulp cavity. And then the material that kind of connects to the pulp cavity, this is what's called the root canal. This is how that stuff gets into the tooth, right, the circulatory system and the uh, neurons, the nervous system, okay? All right, now, different species are going to play around with the different numbers of these bicuspids and cuspids or different numbers of molars, canines, and premolars and incisors. <coughs> um, so the way we kind of identify uh, species is based on their dental formula, which is a description of the number of each type of tooth that they have. So there's a, a couple of different ways to do this. So this is canis, the trans. This is a coyote. And we could describe its dental formula like this. So I have uh, <clears throat> the teeth shown here in the upper jaw, three incisors, lower jaw, three incisors, canine, upper one, lower one, four, four, and then two molars in the upper and three molars in the lower. And this is basically showing me half of the jaw. So we're looking at the teeth from this orientation and only keeping track of these teeth in the upper and lower jaw there. Okay, it could also be represented like this. The first one here, I need to put dashes in there. The first one here is the upper jaw, and then the next one is the lower, and again, we're only looking at half of the jaw, right? Half of the jaw, which means the total number of teeth in the coyote, if we counted all the teeth in the jaw, would be 4, 8, 10, 14, 18, 21. There would be 42 teeth total because there's 21 showed here in half of the jaw. All right, I also have Odo Coileus. Not making it easier on me. That's a mule deer. And its dental formula looks like this. So the total number of incisors would be six. There aren't any on the upper jaw but the lower jaw contains six, three on each side, okay? 
Alright, last thing about teeth. Just checking the time here. Last thing about teeth, there are some modified teeth that you find out there in the world. Uh, these teeth include fangs, which are hollow teeth. <clears throat> There's a tube that connects the outside world to a, a poison gland, and the fangs then can be used to deliver poison from the gland because the fang is hollow. And then you've got tusks, as shown here. <clears throat> These are modified teeth. They tend to be used a lot in sexual selection, and they can be used for defense. So think about the tusk on an elephant right, being used for defense. Uh, tusks on narwhals, that they have that single tusk that sticks out of their head. They live in the ocean. Uh, that's thought to be maintained through sexual selection. Okay? All right, at the boundary of the oral cavity, the mammals have structures called lips. <clears throat> Generally, the upper and lower lips follow the line of the teeth roots. Okay? All right, so... Uh, in us, they're more forward, but in something like uh, a lizard, right, the lips would go all the way back here following the, the teeth row, right? So there would be lips here following the teeth row, okay? <clears throat> okay? In us, we don't follow the teeth uh, as much because we have a structure unique to mammals referred to as cheeks. These are where the upper and lower lips meet forward in the jaw, producing this uh, cheek <coughs> toward the, the back of the lips. Cheeks are thought to be adaptive, right? It's thought to be a, a, this huge evolutionary advancement on how you work a digestive system because cheeks, because of their position, they prevent food from falling out of your mouth whenever you eat. You imagine like a crocodile or a lizard eating something. Whenever they break things up into smaller pieces, the pieces would fall out of the, the teeth onto the ground. Whereas when we chew things up, the cheeks kind of keep things contained within that oral cavity. Right? <clears throat> okay. uh, some mammals use cheeks for storage, like think like a chipmunk, uh, picking up acorns and storing them and then moving them someplace else and dumping them back out. So they can be used like little handbags to move things around. Uh, and then... Uh, finally, the last thing about lips, I knew there was something else to mention here. Uh, in mammals, these are modified uh, because mammals have mammary glands. So uh, the lips are structures that are used for suckling during infancy, right, to get milk from mom. Okay? Lips in the other vertebrates are not pliable. They're not soft tissue, whereas in mammals they're soft, because you have to get that suction with the mammary gland so that you can get the milk out and not a bunch of air. Okay? Okay? Alright, now, as you chew stuff, your <coughs> teeth are doing that mechanical digestion, the salivary amylase is doing chemical digestion, the mucin is coating the food, and then... <coughs> Also in your, your mouth is this structure called the tongue. Uh, one of its functions is to kind of gather up all of that food as it's being broken into pieces and gather it up and using that mucin kind of like stick everything together. So as you chew, you break everything up and then you kind of manipulate that tongue and you move everything into uh, this big ball and this uh, big ball of 
food that's been chewed up and coated with enzymes and mucin is referred to as a bolus. The tongue is then going to push that bolus back into the pharynx. Okay. Now, I, <clears throat> the, the thing about your tongue and its involvement in digestion is as long as you don't think about what it's doing, it seems to work pretty well. So I don't advocate the next time you're eating, kind of thinking about what your tongue is doing, because it's a good way to choke. But while you eat, you kind of uh, subconsciously, that tongue is just moving everything around, avoiding getting crunched by the teeth, hopefully, and uh, rolling everything up into a big bolus, and then pushing it down into the back of the oral cavity uh, where the pharynx is. Okay, the pharynx in us and uh, the terrestrial vertebrates, a lot of them, <clears throat> is also where the respiratory system and the digestive system kind of interact. So let's just do this real quick. Right. kind of surprised. All right, so uh, I've moved food uh, back into here, which is the pharynx. And we know from the respiratory system that air tends to come in through the nose. It's going to enter into the pharynx and move down into the trachea. <clears throat> when the tongue takes the bolus, it's pushing it back towards the pharynx and pushing things towards the esophagus, trachea. Okay? So I, I do want to point out again, I know I've mentioned this before, but uh, this is called a chiasma, not the best engineering. Uh, when you think about how to construct an organism, this is probably not something that you would consciously set up. Because that means any time you eat something, the bolus has to cross over the trachea. If the bolus falls into the trachea, you're going to choke. So there is that little flap here, right, called the epiglottis, which occurs over the opening, which is called the glottis. And the epiglottis job is to close over the glottis anytime a bolus moves over the top of it. So you conduct the bolus into the pharynx, the pharynx is where everything crosses, and then the pharynx is a muscular structure. It's pushing things down into the esophagus. The esophagus would then conduct the bolus down to the stomach through peristalsis. A peristalsis is a traveling wave of constriction all the way down, pushing that bolus down through the esophagus, down to the stomach. Now, at the top of the esophagus is striated muscle. Right? So these first few rings of muscle are striated, uh, which means uh, you can run those, right? You can force yourself to start this peristalsis in the esophagus by swallowing. That starts that first round through uh, conscious movement, which is the swallowing action itself. As you move down the esophagus, the muscle is no longer striated. It's smooth muscle, which means it's being run unconsciously. So as soon as that bolus gets deep enough into the esophagus, involuntary muscle contraction moves it the rest of the way down to the stomach. Okay? In some of the animals, right, we would hit the crop first. The crop is just a big holding bin. And in, uh, in other animals, uh, we're hitting a stomach. So we're talking about mammals, so I'm not going to do the crop and the gizzard. I'm going to do an organ that has kind of both functions at the same time. But as an aside here, uh, birds kind of uh, evolved this crop gizzard trick, probably because a lot of these birds fly over long distances, 
and maybe their food item is only available certain times of the year. So a bird can gorge itself on cherries, and then the cherries would sit in the crop, and then as the gizzard finishes digestion, you drop another uh, few cherries into the gizzard, grind it up more for digestion, release a few more, grind them up, release a few more, grind them up. So you can imagine it, I could fly all day because I ate a big enough meal and that food is being doled out to me little by little into my gizzard. The, the gizzard itself in birds is a highly muscular organ. Many birds will eat rocks. If you've ever watched chickens do that, they like to peck around and eat rocks. And that's because a lot of their diet consists of plant material, sometimes seeds. Seeds can be very, very tough. But if I grind rocks onto seeds, I can pulverize that seed coat and release the energy that's inside the seed. Okay, so in uh, large mammals like deer eating acorns, they're using their molars and their premolars to grind it up into small pieces. Birds don't have that option. They don't have teeth, right? They just have that beak. So I'm going to bring it down and use the gizzard for a lot of mechanical digestion. All right, but in any event, let's, let's do the stomach here. So... I, here's the esophagus, right? I brought stuff down now to the stomach. <clears throat> the, the stomach itself is going to be involved with digestion. Uh, people talk about the stomach. Right. Uh, being separated from the esophagus by this structure called a uh, cardiac sphincter. Uh, <clears throat> but this is not really a true sphincter. So we should probably talk about sphincter here. Sphincter is a circular muscle whose job it is to close off one compartment from another. We'll see these sphincters periodically throughout the digestive system to control movement of material through and the rate at which it moves through. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, there is a, a muscular band here.